All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dick Berner. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's Stern Fireside Chat, which is the third one we've had this semester. Our purpose in doing these Fireside Chats is to promote a rich dialogue between the NYU student and faculty community and market participants, current and for former policymakers, and other thought leaders. The host of today's Fireside Chat is the Stern Center for Global Economy and Business. The center promotes faculty research that emphasizes the global aspect of modern ec economies and business. And we're especially pleased today to have uh, students and faculty from all over NYU in addition to Stern, and so thank you very much for joining us. Today's program will last around 75 minutes. I'll engage our distinguished guest in a dialogue in the first part, followed by audience Q&A that I'll moderate and we'll finish by 545. Please note on the screen, which you will see in just a moment, and I will switch to that, <clears throat> that you can submit questions to our guest using your smartphone or other device by going to the website slido.com and entering the code number 2222 in the box labeled join. Please provide your full name. We don't accept anonymous questions. You can also vote on the questions that others have submitted. This will help us judge the issues that are of greatest interest to you. Our distinguished guest today probably needs no introduction to many of you. Roger Ferguson is President and Chief Executive Officer of TIAA, the leading provider of retirement services in the academic, research, medical, and cultural fields. As such, he helps manage and protect the assets of many in this room. Any of you have questions for him that relate to your accounts? Please wait until the end of the session <laughs> for that. Previously, Roger was chair of Swiss Re America and vice chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. So he's had quite an inspiring career. Please join me in welcoming him to Stern. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dick. Thanks for, thanks for the uh, kind introduction. Absolutely. So, Roger, we're going to start just by uh, doing a little introduction, and we'd like to start by having you tell us a little bit about, for those people who are not familiar with the company, tell us a little bit about TIAA um, and a word or two about the culture in your business would okay. also be helpful. All right. So, TIAA, um, first, it stands for Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association of America. We dropped the last day. Uh, was founded 101 years ago. Uh, it was a brainchild of Andrew Carnegie. Uh, Carnegie was on the board of Cornell, um, um, and he, he looked around and he saw some of the leading minds of the day, as he said, making less than my clerks, or clerks as we'd call them, and uh, literally not being able to retire. We were working to the last day, retiring into, into abject poverty. Uh, and he gathered a brain trust of really smart individuals around him, and this was now 1918 and created this thought that um, he was going to give this new company some money, uh, and both the universities and the professors and other staff would contribute and have this money professionally managed. Uh, and then when they retired, using the annuity, they would then get a guaranteed income for life. So that's where we started, um, about a million dollars from uh, Carnegie, uh, and it worked. Uh, here we are 101 years later, uh, as you point out, managing $1.2 trillion, uh, serving now roughly 5 million Americans at 15,000 uh, institutions. Um, we have an unusual structure in that we're not a publicly traded company. Uh, we're owned by a, a group called the Overseers. And Carnegie's idea was he didn't want the company to be mutual either um, because he wanted to be in the hands of professional managers who would take a long-term perspective which goes to the culture. So we have a culture that embodies, I think, the best um, of all worlds, which is a long-term perspective. Um, but not having external shareholders, it means that we uh, focus on what's in the long-term interest of the people we call our participants, those who have saved with us. Uh, we don't have to pay dividends to anyone else other than those folks who are annuitized with us. And so I think it's really you know, a very good culture that allows us to put the, uh, the participants' interests first, and to uh, think about long-term perspectives with uh, you know, a long-time horizon. Um, and so that's, that's sort of who we are, that's where we came from, and that's a bit of the culture as it stands today. Great. Well, speaking of long-term problems, let's start right by talking about some of our big challenges that we have in our country. And the question is, 
Um, do we have a retirement saving challenge in America? Uh, what's the nature of that challenge? And uh, there are actually several questions related to this. And what do you think we should do about it? All right, so I think we absolutely have, absolutely have a retirement challenge in America. Um, I tend to avoid the word crisis and go to challenge. Um, and, and the reason I think of it that way is this is a, uh, an issue that's been a long time coming. Um, it is getting more and more urgent, but there are things we can do to fix. So long time coming in what sense? Well, first and foremost, the retirement challenge is a challenge of an aging population. Uh, we have you know, an aging population here, baby boomers. There's uh, you know, uh, uh, about 10,000 baby boomers each reach the so-called retirement age of 65 every day. Uh, within four or five years, there'll be 80 million retirees, and we'll soon have a society in which uh, older individuals over 65 outnumber children, which will be the first time that's occurred in, in U.S. history. As a footnote here, um, we are not, by any stretch of imagination, the oldest society. You know, China is getting older, Japan already, uh, Western Europe, parts of Eastern Europe. And so this is you know, a global problem, uh, and in some sense, not, the U.S. is not the worst position. Um, so the second part of the challenge is the um, legacy pension plans, known as defined benefit plans, have you know, basically gone away um, for a variety of reasons. And they have, in most of the world, most of the uh, industrial parts of our society, been replaced by what's called a 401k, which everyone knows of. But what you probably don't know is a 401k was never meant to be the primary retirement program. It was meant to be a supplement to the pre-existing defined benefit plan. So the second part of the challenge is that there's been a shift of risk for retirement savings and pay down from companies which was a DB plan, to uh, the 401k space. I might emphasize that the TIA program is slightly different and um, doesn't have some of the same challenges as the 401k plan. So that's the second part of the challenge. And then the third part of the challenge is your point, Dick, which is in the space where individuals are now accountable for preparing for retirement, we have a dramatic shortfall uh, in savings um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the Fed has estimated uh, retirement shortfall of somewhere between four and seven trillion dollars. I've seen numbers as much as 24 trillion. I don't know if I would um, buy into that very large number, but four to seven is a large enough number. Anything so with trillions as a shortfall uh, is a challenge. Um, and so that, that's sort of uh, the macro, uh, bigger picture. Um, the other challenge is around the social security system, which is sort of the bedrock platform for everybody. Uh, and all of you know that that system uh, has already reached a stage where the uh, inflow uh, is less than the payout. Uh, and by 2033, 2035, not too far from now, um, unless something is done, the social security system, which is the bedrock for everybody, will only be able to pay somewhere around 75, maybe 80 percent of the benefits. So we've got a private sector problem that I've just described, and then the public sector problem. Um, uh, and the final point I'd make is within the 401k space, there's a third problem, which is even if you save enough, 401k systems are not set up to provide for the, the lifetime pension, the guaranteed income for life, or the personal pension, whatever phrase you want to use. So even if you are an individual, and this is not true for academics who mainly have 403B, have our company, but for others, if you have a 401k system, even if you save this huge amount of money that people uh, advertise as sort of your number, there's no way uh, to automatically turn that into a, a, a personal pension. So we've got a number of different challenges with different components. So what are the solutions? Um, Let's start with what may be the easiest, which is the middle one, which is the Social Security system. Um, you know, the, if you get together in this room, you know, the world's or the country's leading retirement economists, they could probably write out the answer to the Social Security problem on a three by five card. You know, it'd have something to do with uh, some technical fixes to the way it's indexed to inflation, but more importantly, uh, thinking about you know, how much money comes into the system, do we change the benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of fixes that one could take to Social Security, uh, and the challenge there is more about political will than anything else, which is not to say it's easy. It's just to say there's a technical answer, but we don't know if we have the political will. 
So that's one. The problem I talked about of uh, 401k systems, uh, even if you have enough savings, not generating uh, or creating an opportunity for you to create a personal pension. Believe it or not, there's a, a fix that's sort of underway there. Uh, Congress has passed something called the SECURE Act, which makes it easier uh, to have annuities in 401k plans. And so that got through the House. I think the vote was 417 to 3 or something like that. I may have the number off by one or two. Uh, and now it needs to get through the Senate, where it's being held up by you know, a few holes. So perhaps, perhaps that can be fixed. And then you get to the bigger intractable one, which is uh, aging populations and uh, an absence of savings. Uh, and there the challenge really is increasing savings um, over time, uh, uh, making uh, retirement more readily available. Um, so that's you know, called the savings gap and the coverage gap. Those are obviously longer term solutions. Uh, and then I say humorously, but without real, without real humor, Part of the longer term solution, frankly, is to deal with uh, the fact that the fertility rate in the country is, has fallen. Um, and I say humorously in all these kinds of uh, discussions that if you know someone who's of childbearing age or a young couple, encourage them to have three kids um, because you know, that's the only way you're going to deal with the fertility challenge. Um, and so you know, some short term fixes, some intermediate term fixes, many of them go through policy. Some of them are really more structural um, and have to sort of drive the way the economy actually works. So I don't know if that makes sense to the room, but those are some of the ways to think about the problem sure. and some of the solutions. Sure, that's helpful. So one of the other challenges is the market environment in which we live. Right. And you know, while the number or the dollar volume of bonds with negative interest rates has recently declined because market rates have come up somewhat, there's still around $11 trillion of right. fixed income securities around the world, sovereign debt actually, that that, uh, that have negative interest rates. So it's a low, low, relatively relative to history, obviously, as we were talking about before. Interest rate environment doesn't look like that's going to change all that quickly. Mm -hmm. How does that affect uh, pension management and thinking about the returns that you're going to get on the asset side of, uh, of the equation? Um, so uh, first, all of us have to recognize, as you point out, that the likely return from a standard fixed income portfolio is going to be much lower than would have been the case normally. Um, fortunately, in this country, we're not confronting negative rates, but as you point out, in Europe and, and uh, parts of Asia, they are already, and that's, that's a bigger challenge for them. But even X that, having sort of a lower for a very, very long time environment, um, uh, I think can create uh, some challenges for you know, a pension plan, um, particularly for you know, public pension plans, which have to assume a certain discount rate. And those discount rates have tended to be relatively high, you know, seven, eight, six percent. And so that becomes, you know, a much bigger challenge for them than it is for, for my company. The solution for um, all of us in this space, I believe, is to create a, a more diversified portfolio um, of assets to, to match your liabilities. And you know, we, in the pension world, and certainly in my company, we had the chance to do that because our liabilities have very, very long tenure on them. Um, so you know, the way we have confronted this is by becoming larger uh, and having more of our assets or the percentage exposed to uh, things like agriculture, timber, um, infrastructure, you know, real estate, et cetera. And so you know, in my company, we've been building up those assets along with everything else. Um, for the last 10 or 11 years, and that's worked out quite well because even as interest rates are lower, returns or the valuations in some of these other asset classes go up, and it creates the ability to have a relatively predictable and stable revenue pool, but the sources of a change over time so you're not so tied to the level or the shape of the yield curve. And that's really sort of the intellectual construct you want to deal with, which is, which is how do you get your assets to not be completely tied to the level and shape of the yield curve right. when you have, as you point out, um, uh, both low short-term rates and a relatively flat yield curve. So you said we don't have a retirement saving crisis. You prefer not to talk about that. But what about in pensions in particular? One aspect of the sort of the three-legged stool of, mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the saving picture. Is there a crisis in pension funds? There, so uh, again, it depends on the kind of pension you fund you talk about. So Social Security, we've already talked about. That's a pension plan. I was recently at a meeting with some individuals who are running um, some of the larger state plans, and they are 
struggling with this uh, implicit or explicit discount rate of a seven or eight percent, and so they have a real challenge of throwing off those sorts of returns on, on a year-to-year -year basis. Right. Um, and you know what's going to happen with them is they're going to ultimately have to be backstopped by taxpayers in their in their states and localities. I'm sure. Um, if you have what we have, which is a technical term, a purely participating program, then you have less of those sorts of concerns. And our job is to think about absolute return over periods of time. And so, uh, make no mistake about it, these issues um, are challenging for all pension plans. Right more challenging for some than others, most challenging for Social Security because they don't have the chance to invest outside of the government bonds that they own, and becomes less and less challenging as you get out to what my company does, which is much more of a participating uh, kind of retirement. That's fairly technical, but I think the, the point here is to think about the flexibility that any pension plan has to invest across asset classes, and the more flexibility a pension plan has, the less of these challenges. The one that has the least flexibility is Social Security. Some state yes. plans are in the middle, and we're at a position where we are capable of investing with a long 10, 12 year time horizon because of the nature of our liabilities, and that gives us much more flexibility, and consequently, the ability to maintain a you know, somewhat higher return than others. Sure. So, one of the things that's happened in the investment industry is people have started to adopt broader goals for thinking mm -hmm. about investment, in particular, so called ESG goals. And how should we think about those, those goals and socially responsible investing? Um, so I believe, and my company believes, that those are very legitimate goals to have. Um, and the issue now is to figure out two or three things. One is, are there enough uh, assets to invest with that way, that mindset? And secondly, and here you know, finance professors and others have different points of view, do you have to give up any return to pursue an ESG, responsible investing strategy? So on the second question, I think the industry has generally come to a consensus that I'd say the, over long periods of time, uh, returns for ESG portfolios approximate those for other portfolios. Um, uh, and I've seen some individuals and some uh, observers would argue that it may be a better return. So, but let's at least start with the thought that the literature now and performance sort of suggests that you're not giving up any performance if you're choosing an ESG yeah. approach. Secondly, we do know there are isolated cases where having thought about ESG factors might allow you to outperform. So think about companies that uh, are revealed to have very, very poor governance and their stock collapses. Um, you know, so, you know, going back to an Enron or a Tyco, et cetera. So someone thinking, hmm, you know, an investor thinking that governance model for that particular company doesn't look so good, I'm going to stay away from it. Or think about what happened to you know, BP stock when, when you know, the, the Gulf oil spill occurred. So you know, there's also reason to think on a case-by-case -case basis, seeing things through an ESG lens, taking a longer portfolio, a long perspective might end up being you know, sort of a smart thing to do. And so, you know, we now, and we and our company have taken uh, responsible investing uh, in ESG very, very seriously for long periods of time. We have um, uh, one of the oldest and I th the oldest and one of the largest socially screened accounts, and it's performed quite well over long periods of time. So I think this is something that's not a trend. I think it is an asset class. And the performance, I would say, to date is at least as good over long periods as others. And Arguably, we'll see if it actually ends up being better because you avoid some of these risks that could unfold um, in these areas around you know, poor governance or uh, a lack of environmental consciousness, et cetera. Right. Some of that revolves around risk management. So right. how, how do and should asset managers think about risk uh, and risk management, and how should policymakers think about the risks in asset management activities? So the business of asset management is a business of risk taking. Um, uh, it's risk management, it's risk assessment, it's thinking about returns versus risk. Uh, and so I think any good portfolio manager, any good asset management company should have risk front and center to the way it thinks about things because we're always in the business of thinking about potential return versus potential risk. And that range of risk um, has got to expand. You know, it starts with financial market risk. In the old days, it was credit risk and financial market risk. And, 
and now you get out to you know strategic risk, ESG, et cetera, et cetera. But all of those should be play into you know, thinking about, am I getting paid for the risk? You're not going to avoid risk in this business. Right. You're paid to take risk in a smart way. Um, and, and that is, in some reasons, why you know, fundamental investing, I think, still has a place in this world. Um, I think, on the other hand, you know, as regulators think about risk, they've got to understand that the risk in asset management is quite different from the risk in uh, banking, for example, and may or may not be different from the risk in insurance, right? The risk in banking is, uh, as you well know, uh, liquidity transformation risk. You take short-term liabilities, uh, bank deposits, people can come and remove them you know, on a daily basis if it's a demand account or every six months if it's right. a CD, whatever it may be. And you take that and then you invest it in very long-term assets, call a 30-year bond. And so bank risk is around this uh, maturity, trans maturity transformation, uh, liquidity mismatch issue. That is not the challenge that asset management tends to have. Um, there, there are very few cases where there are some, but a well-run asset management organization tends to match the maturity and liquidity profile of the liability that it's investing and the asset class in which it's investing. Um, and so I think you should think about those risks in asset management as being really sort of quite different. Uh, and the final point I'd make, at least we are an insurance company, and we've worked a lot with the regulators for them to understand how different our risk profile, uh, profile is from that of a bank. And so you know, I think the issue around risk is think about you know, the, the degree to which it's a maturity or liquidity mismatch issue or there's some other challenges. Um, and then because we're in the risk-taking business, they should be asking us, do you have good metrics, do you have good mechanisms to manage, to assess and manage the risk and make sure you're getting returns that out outweigh the risk? Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. So um, you talked a little bit about uh, when you and I were talking earlier about passive investing. Mm -hmm. And some people are arguing that passive investing and the ownership of a broad array of uh, securities or so-called common ownership is leading to anti-competitive behavior. Right. And I'm just wondering what you think about that, uh, that idea and how should we talk about that? So I've seen it uh, written about um, mainly in, with academics and then I think a few policymakers in that with a question, which is that the case? My real world observation is that that is you know, far from the case. Um, um, the theory of the case for those don't, who don't understand it is that you know, a big investor, let's say an index fund that owns you know, all the companies in an industry would tacitly encourage them to not compete. Um, there's no evidence that I can see that points that out. Uh, secondly, um, it is not as though the only investors are passive investors. There are active investors who choose one industry participant versus another and they expect to see you know, sort of good returns. Uh, and the final point is, um, for better or for worse, most compensation plans for most companies uh, deal in part with sort of total shareholder return, how your company does versus an index of one sort or another. So I think the incentives are not, uh, there's no mechanism for you know, passive investors to sort of drive a lower level of competition in the industry. And I don't think the incentives in most industries are aligned around that. So I think this is an abstract concept um, as sometimes a case that I think is, doesn't bear up under real empirical examination. Certainly abstract, but um, you know, there's, there's definitely phenomena that are going on in our, uh, in our corporate structure and that people are starting to question. So how do you think about today the role of uh, the corporation in society, which is really hotly debated? Right. It relates a little bit to ESG goals. It relates to a broader right. uh, responsibility to Stakeholders, can you share your thoughts about that a little bit? So first, you know, no doubt that the pendulum um, and some of the business literature, maybe driven by this recent statement from the Business Roundtable, has swung from the goal of corporations to you know, maximize shareholder value to this notion of having broader sets of goals, uh, including stakeholders and societies, et cetera. Um, first, full disclosure, uh, Many, many years ago, I was a, uh, an associate and then partner at McKinsey. I wrote a 
little piece from the McKinsey Quarter with another uh, partner around exactly this question. And ultimately, I think where I came out on this is we should not create a false dichotomy. You know, if it is true that the, the goal of a business is to maximize shareholder value over long periods of time, which may not be the same as quarter to quarter, then taking into consideration you know, how your product works and whether or not you are paying your uh, employees correctly and are you a good citizen in the community, all have to play into this discussion. Um, because if we have seen, you know, if you have a product that is perceived to be not very safe, you know, eventually you know, your ability to hold on to market share will collapse and your shareholders uh, will, will suffer. We've obviously seen you know, other kinds of issues around governance that I've just talked about with a couple of big examples. Um, and so I would argue if you take the right time horizon, and that does not mean infinite, it, it does mean more than a quarter or two, right. but the period over which a strategy plays out, call it three, four, five years, maybe a little longer, you know, that is... I think enough time to see an alignment between shareholder return and maximizing that versus all these other issues. And we shouldn't therefore create a false dichotomy. I think we should recognize that a good business leader has to consider all these things. Right. Um, you know, your job is not to create you know, uh, you know, unsustainably good behaviors or outcomes for a bunch of folks who aren't your shareholders, but nor is it to be rapacious around trying to drive only shareholder return at the expense of everything else, because that, is, that proves not to be sustainable over long periods of time. Right, that's an important perspective, and thanks for that. Um, because obviously, as you're well aware, there are, there's a big debate going on there's around these debate. issues, and probably is gonna continue. It's certainly gonna be one of the features of our upcoming electoral landscape, uh, I think. that's right, landscape, I think, I think. Yeah, that's right. and look, to be fair, to, to that point, some of the issues that we're confronting in modern day capitalism, um, particularly around things like wealth inequality and income inequality, may or may not ultimately be at the doorstep of the corporate sector by itself. You know, some of these challenges have to do with you know, other kinds of policies that drive you know, some of these outcomes. And so you know, as we have this discussion about what's the role of corporations, it's got to be, I think, conjoined with what's the role of you know, appropriate you know, tax policy, redistribution policy, et cetera, and how do, you, how do you balance all of these things to create what we all want, which is a capitalism that's highly inclusive and that you know, allows individuals to you know, uh, you know, achieve their long-term financial goals in a way that's consistent with maximum growth in the society. Right. So inequality is a big subject. Uh, it's not on our list of questions, but it's something I think about a lot. Uh, do you have any thoughts about the things that we need to do to promote more equality of opportunity and more equality of wealth and income in the United States? So, you know, like, any, like anyone else in this room, I probably have some thoughts. How, how valid they are, I don't know. Um, I, I don't, so count me perhaps in, you know, the American dream is still alive camp. Um, I just look at my own background, starting from not very much and ending up being the CEO of a Fortune 100 company. Um, it sort of convinces me that, you know, there are things that do work in America, and let's not ignore that. Um, having said that, I, I do think we have to recognize that, and the reason I say it is I'm not, I don't know, some of my friends would disagree with this, I don't know if the challenge is equality of opportunity. Um, uh, I think the challenge has to do with a number of um, the mechanisms that emerge when you get small amounts of inequality that then get larger and larger that then reinforce the inequality. So we have a couple of things in this country that I think um, tend to uh, be unintentionally be driving increases in inequality. One is we have a very sort of unequal education system. Um, and most economists would argue that one of the things that really drives better outcomes is education. You know, education is positively correlated with a number of economic outcomes. You know, the, the greater your education, the, the less likelihood that you'll fall into you know, long-term unemployment, a variety of things. You get much better health outcomes that correlate with education. And yet we have an education system um, uh, that depends heavily on where you happen to live. Um, and you know, by definition, you know, the, the better school districts tend to have higher house prices, tend to you know, therefore reinforce 
um, uh, these issues. And so, you know, if I had to think about as an economist and a policy observer, though it's not immediately done, do, do we actually think about education opportunity and what actually happens to education as being a place that's reinforcing inequality or reducing inequality? So I, I would always look there. Obviously, that then goes to health outcomes, and there's a lot of data that indicate that individuals who don't have very much money end up having much worse health outcomes, and that affects, right. you know, life capabilities. Um, and then, obviously, you know, the ability at a young age to start to, you know, build wealth is highly differentiated across the country, and that then plays into, you know, outcomes going forward. So, you know, none of these things is an easy fix. Uh, I do think the inequality issues that we're confronting and uh, appropriately debating are very real and should not be ignored. Um, uh, and, a, you know, I think many economists would argue, well, let's start to look certainly at education and other things. Uh, and then I think we are going to debate, I don't have the right answer, society will figure out, you know, if you make those things work a little better, to what degree do you want policies that are, you know, how redistributed do you want policies to be? Right. And that is, you know, what, you know, one of the debates that exists not just here but in other places as well. Yep. And we'll see what society votes on, right? There are different models out there and you know, where we end up in this country as the pendulum swings back and forth uh, will be interesting to see. So let's sh shift gears a little bit to the Fed. Okay. Um, you were vice chair of the Fed and a couple of questions about the Fed. Are you concerned about the Fed's independence? And uh, uh, I'm sure that you, know, you agree with most of the people in this room that having an independent central bank is a good thing for uh, the conduct of monetary policy. And, financial stability. Mm -hmm. uh, are you concerned about that uh, being a threat? So I'm, uh, I'm not concerned about it in, in a couple of senses. One is I think the Fed has and will continue to work really hard to protect its, its independence. Um, and so you know, that, that I think is bedrock given and I've observed for many, many generations, not just you know, most recently, um, a real sense that there is very strong legitimate value and consensus around having uh, independence. The second thing I observe is while you know, this is not the first time we've had a president who has been pushing for you know, interest rates to move in one direction or another, by definition, you know, presidents tend to want interest rates lower. You know, no one should be surprised by that. Um, but I have observed that in Congress, for example, um, you know, there hasn't been you know, sort of echo of you know, congressmen attempting to influence, um, influence the Fed. And as you well know, the Fed is ultimately a creature of Congress, and it was created by an act back in 1913. Um, you know, the Federal Reserve Chair and other governors and other uh, policymakers you know, do go and testify before Congress. And as I've observed those those interactions, I would say most folks um, in both houses are very respectful of independence. And so if there were going to be an undermining of independence in a legislative sense, I don't see any, any progress in that direction. Uh, and so I look at this and say we are in, a, in an interesting time where you know, not for the first time in history has a president tried to encourage lower rates, but I've observed the Fed doing what it thinks is right, and I've observed the legislature, which created this institution of the Federal Reserve System, looking as though it you know, firmly believes from a legislative standpoint that the in independence is right. And so I you know, have to be mindful of all times, uh, but I feel you know, highly confident that we'll continue to see the Fed acting in an independent fashion and being reinforced by you know, the Congress which created the institution. So is there anything that stands out uh, about what the Fed is doing or the way they're communicating about policy that you might uh, offer suggestions for improvement? <laughs> uh, well, first, I, you know, when I was on the board, uh, the thought of former Fed governors offering suggestions for improvement. Uh, I had to <laughs> ask the question. <laughs> you know, was not where I'd want to go. Um, so let me, but, you know, I, let me observe a couple of things. The Fed is confronting a highly unusual configuration right now, which makes it a, a bit of a challenge to figure out exactly what the path forward is. Um, so we have uh, very low inflation by almost any expectation, given the, the again, fortunately, very low level of unemployment. 
Um, and so we see, uh, so the Fed, I think, is to figure out, well, gee, what is driving inflation dynamics? Right. And to what degree should they allow the economy to still run and drive down unemployment? And you know, there are no obvious answers to that. And so you do see very serious discussion and debate um, in, in the FOMC. And you see it spilling over uh, sometimes in the vote. Um, and so two or three meetings ago, two meetings ago, I think, they had, uh, the, there were three dissents, uh, and they were unusual, one in the number, but secondly, two <coughs> individuals thought that there shouldn't be a cut in rates at all, and one individual thought that the cut in rates should be bigger. bigger. So it tells you how you know, challenging the economic circumstances are for them to assess. The second thing they're, they're working on and trying to understand is the degree to which um, you know, uncertainties that exist uh, in and around the marketplace might play in over time to a slowing of the economy. Uh, and you know, no one really knows what to do in that space, and so they've made their best judgments possible. Uh, and the third thing that's very much on everyone's mind is, you know, is it true that the potential growth rate for the US economy has slowed down so much um, that, you know, that what we're getting now is roughly, you know, potential, and consequently, inflation is not going to pick up. And so there are a number of uh, policy challenges that they're trying to deal with. And you know, fortunately, because they're a relatively transparent organization and has become so over time, you can see that debate you know, and uncertainty playing out uh, in the vote, in different speeches, people, different uh, policymakers you know, being comfortable or uncomfortable with the stance of policy. And you know, that's, though it's maybe uncomfortable sometimes, it's a real reflection of an open and transparent uh, central bank working really hard around some, you know, challenging uh, issues that are, you know, unique. Uh, I think pretty much unique in the history of the central bank. So let's talk about financial stability. Um, are there? Do you have concerns about things that might pose vulnerabilities in the financial system or threats to financial stability? And if so, you know, what should we do about them? Um, very good question. To which one has to. Uh, one has to approach with a certain amount of humility, right? Because you're an expert in financial stability as much as anyone else. There are very few uh, experts who, if you go back and think about the moments of financial instability, called it just right, right? You see them in hindsight. Um, uh, but very few folks have the foresight to see exactly when they are unfolding. And so think about the bursting of the dot com bubble around 2000, 2001. Yep. Obviously, much more dramatically, uh, in some sense more tragically, even the, the housing crisis that led to you know, the, the Great Recession of 2008, right. 2009. Um, you know, there are imbalances that one saw in hindsight that very few people saw at, you know, before it occurred. So looking at where we are now, I think there are places that many market observers have expressed some concern. You put your finger on one of them, which is, you know, is there you know, a, a, a bond bubble, so-called, i.e., is demand so far outstripping the supply of bonds that we're now getting negative rates, or is that being driven by something else? That's a question that's on people's minds. Um, I've seen a few folks, not many, but a few, ask the question uh, about um, you know, low investment grade bonds and, you know, is there a risk that they may, may flip over? Uh, and then we had a very interesting example that came up that is not necessarily a financial instability question, but if one thinks about you know the the um, I think now aborted IPO effort for WeWorks, some folks ask the question: Gee, you know, are are, are private markets you know, having too much capital, chasing too few good ideas, and leading to you know uh, excess valuations in that market? What's interesting there is the ability to then take those to the public market, as the WeWorks case showed, is quite truncated. Um, because while there may be a lot of demand for really good ideas, it turns out that the ability to get off an IPO at prices that aren't supported by the underlying business model um, can give one some comfort that even if there are issues in that part of the, the market, other things aren't, you know, the, the, the public market aren't, is not going to allow that to be you know, validated, so to speak. So that's a long sort of technical answer to say, don't know quite where the next imbalance is going to be. Um, I don't happen to think that there's a, 
you know, a, a bubble, so call it, in, in bonds, I think, to reflect some policy decisions that, that have been made. And the other place where there may, may be some concerns tends not to spill over into the public sector, in the public right. markets. Right. Um, you mentioned private markets. Uh, do we have the right balance uh, between private and public markets in our capital markets framework? And um, it looks like a lot of companies are deciding to go private, or some are, and there's yeah. some headlines. Uh, for example, uh, Walgreens uh, right. just recently. Um, does this represent signs of excess, or is this just the normal functioning of our capital markets and getting that balance right? Um, I think it represents three things. One is interest rates certainly are very low, so there's you know, plenty of capital. Right. Secondly, um, I think it also reflects the fact that so-called PE has become an asset class um, that many individuals, many f uh, folks participate in you know, directly or indirectly. And what do I mean by that? Um, there are you know, a number of, of asset management complexes, including my own, that participate in private equity markets on behalf of individuals, right. which is sort of a net positive thing. And so we've now, not, when I say we, I don't mean just us, but the asset management business has found ways to you know, bring the returns from PE that used to be you know, the, the bailiwick of super wealthy uh, in, individuals and certain kinds of institutions more broadly. And so that's, you know, I think, has helped to maintain a certain kind of balance in the space. So do I think there's an imbalance? I think what this really reflects is a maturation of another asset class that actually, for whom the benefits are, can be broadly shared. Um, and all of this emerging at a time when you know, interest rates are relatively low and therefore there's a fair amount of capital looking for uh, what I would describe as uncorrelated returns. So earlier on, I talked about equities, uh, uh, agriculture, timber, real assets. One could have easily added private equity as another one of those asset classes that give you uncorrelated return that you know, a lot of money, including some from my company, is, is certainly interested in participating in. Sure. So I don't think it's an imbalance. I think it's just a reflection of a maturation of a certain, of another asset class. Right. Um. So here's a hypothetical. If a company stock <laughs> a has a, uh, well, you've got a background in law, both law and economics. Right. And I want to ask you about so that, I'm being too. cold called in my <laughs> contracts class. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Ferguson, if a company stock, <laughs> yes, professor, go ahead. <laughs> if a company stock has a high expected return, mm -hmm. um, then how would TIA invest in that company or look at that company as a potential area in which to invest? What do you mean by high expected if, return? Well, you know, it's, Past performances okay. is uh, suggestive of high ex expected future returns, even though we all know that we don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> right. But, but uh, and you mentioned WeWork, that's certainly a, a cautionary right. tale about expected returns. But um, you know, how do you balance the expectation of high returns against the kind of things we were talking about before, stewardship um, and governance? and uh, and the way that that company runs its business as opposed to the returns that it earns on its capital? So, look, I think the answer to this question ultimately goes to you know, a dispassionate assessment of whether or not the strategic goals and business model are sustainable. Right. Um, uh, and that goes to, you know, as we saw in some cases, sort of, uh, ironically, internal imbalances within a company, you know, borrowing too much, too little return, et cetera. And so one can't simply look at so-called expected return in the abstract. You have to look at expect return versus the risk that you take, take, or that the company's taking to see if that return all actually, kinds of risk, all kinds of risk right. to see if that return actually uh, gives you the right kind of um, if that expected return gives you the right kind of risk-adjusted return. And so one might think this is a, a group of finance folks. One might think of creating you know, various types of sharp ratios, right? There, there's a sharp ratio for, you know, how your return is versus a riskless, an expected riskless return. And, you know, if you had that concept, that mindset of, okay, is that expected return actually paying for the risk that's embedded in not just the strategy, but also the execution right. of the strategy? Right. Um, and in that sense, you know, there are, there's no such thing as really expected return. There's only a risk-adjusted return, and then you have to compare the risk-adjusted return as best you can estimate it before 
um, events occur with with whatever you know benchmark you might have sure. or whatever the risk rate might be, yep. or whatever your internal hurdle rate might be. So right. I think there are ways to think about it that bring risk in, and that I think that's what drives the answer. Right. So um, you acquired Nuveen uh, mm -hmm. not long ago. I think it was mm -hmm. a couple three years ago. Yeah. And uh, can you discuss some of the integration challenges in? Uh, that might have followed from that acquisition. So the first thing that one thinks about if you're if if you are in the business uh, as we were of acquiring another asset management business, is to recognize where value comes from in asset management. And the vast majority of value in asset management actually goes up and down the elevator every day. It's called the portfolio managers and their process and their teams. And so when we acquired Intervene, our my our first approach was leave you know our legacy TIA investment teams and the Naveen teams and processes alone, because I did not want to bring the two together in a way that was disruptive and drive out um, really good portfolio managers. Um, and so we were, frankly, slow uh, by purpose, thoughtful, strategic approach uh, to you know, bring them together relatively slowly. Um, where we did start, and when we did start, it was in uh, activities that were not at the front office, not in the portfolio management, asset management part of the business, but in mid and back office activities where you can you know, more easily bring things together. Uh, and only now have we started to integrate more broadly across the organization, having owned the company for two to three years. So that's worked out you know, reasonably well. Um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the fact that while there may have been you know, a, a, a few portfolio managers who chose to do something else, the vast majority stayed with us. Um, and, and the integration has actually gone you know, relatively smoothly. Um, the other thing that's worked well is uh, the legacy Naveen company obviously has a, quite a history in munis. And yep. that's been a, turned out to be a good asset class. And they've got very good distribution um, that has allowed us back to some of the points you made earlier, particularly to bring out the legacy TI CREF uh, mutual funds that have an ESG or responsible investing right. um, um, uh, angle to them. So it's actually been, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased from a, uh, every dimension of how well that's actually worked. Right. Coming back to the regulatory environment, <coughs> one of the things that came up recently but which didn't uh, pa get passed was the fiduciary rule. Um, and I'm wondering how you think about you know, the need for such a rule, whether it should have been done the way that it was proposed through the Labor Department or whether there should be some alternative that tries to achieve the same objective and principle. How, how should we think about that well, in the context of regulation for asset management? Well, look, the way we should think about it is that right now it's very much a, a, a live issue. And we in the industry are waiting to see how this, how this sorts itself out. Because first it started at the SEC, as you well know, I'm sorry, the Labor Department, as you well know. Then the SEC came out with uh, an approach, um, and a number of attorneys generals did not agree with that approach. So as, I'm, as we are sitting here, I think the, the issue now is to figure out what is the, the law of the land going to be. And then once that's you know, established and becomes you know, relatively stable, then all of us need to you know, rise to that level uh, for sure. Um, I should also mention that uh, the uh, NAIC, which is the insurance commissioners, also are thinking about this um, in, in their space. And so there are many different regulatory and, and judicial bodies um, that are considering it. And I think the answer is, let's wait and let's see exactly how all this sorts out. And then it's our job in, in uh, the asset management business to you know, meet whatever the regulatory standard is. So. Um, I'd say more to come and very much in flux. Okay. Uh, switching back to the macro, a couple more questions there. First, um, in the next downturn, and there is going to be one at some point, we don't know exactly when, but let's say in the next downturn, um, what unconventional monetary policies do you expect the Fed to adopt? And <laughs> do you have any thoughts about that? Um, if you had new phrases, unconventional, because I think the reality is... Now they become conventional. Now they become <laughs> conventional, right? So I think we've seen it. Um, we went to places that when we were in school, Kim and others were in school, were not even you know, theoretically possible. I, I don't recall anyone in money and banking or macro theory teaching about negative interest, negative nominal interest rates. 
um, you know, we all knew that the size of the Fed's balance sheet might be relevant. Um, we had seen, um, you know, and some of you will recall something called Operation Twist, where the Federal Reserve tried to you know, adjust and manage in, uh, in a not very successful way the shape of the yield curve. And so you know, what we saw in this most recent crisis is things that were unexpected in terms of negative, real, negative uh, nominal rates and a perfection of the use of uh, the yield curve forward guidance, uh, I'm sorry, the balance sheet and forward guidance to influence the yield curve. So I would expect in the next, um, if and when, and there will be at some point a, a downturn, we'll see the use of that range of tools. You know, the, the one thing that was not explicitly used, um, and I don't know if they would go there, and I don't know how well it would work, is obviously trying to also drive um, out through a broader range of asset classes. So we did see at some point, uh, <coughs> as an example, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority going directly into equity markets. Um, I don't know if the Fed would ever go to that place. I'm not suggesting that, but that is a, you know, an unconventional measure that we've seen in other central banks uh, and monetary authorities. And then obviously, you know, everyone understands that not necessarily for us, but for a small open economy, uh, trying to adjust the exchange rate might also have some impact in terms of getting the economy going again. Um, and so those are other tools that I would be surprised if the Fed used because the nature of our economy is quite different. But we've seen other economies use these things. And so I guess at the end of the day, if one looks around, not just the US, but all central banks, almost every tool has been tried at this stage. Either if we've done it, the Europeans have done it, the Japanese have done it, smaller institutions have done it. Um, and so I would say in the next crisis, the, the challenge is going to be to, uh, to pick and choose among this menu to see which of these so-called unconventional tools, which have all been tried, you know, are, are the ones the Fed's going to want to use the next time around. We talked a lot about how you uh, have adopted alternative assets, uncorrelated assets, to right. improve investment returns on a sharp ratio basis. And so um, what about the macro? When uh, the macro circumstances change, how do you incorporate that into your investment management process? Well, um, you used the word risk before, right? And, and as you well know, there are these concepts in investments, risk on or risk off. And so as we think about evolving and changing macro environments, we have to figure out how we move, roughly speaking, our pendulum from uh, risk on to risk off, which is to say, you know, asset classes that perform particularly well when the economy is growing versus those that perform better when the economy is slowing. And so one might think it is moving to so-called defensive stocks or cyclically defensive. Um, we obviously would move sort of up the grade of investment grade, move away from things that may not maintain their investment grade status in a downturn to, to you know, parts of um, uh, what's called the capital stack that are, are uh, less equity-like and more likely to, to perform predictably during, <coughs> during a downturn. So it's that, that kind of thing that one does. But one has to be careful or be mindful of the fact that you know, managing over a trillion dollars, the actual, you know, the ability to, to shift the risk on, risk off button is pretty limited. You know, one does not come in one day and say, you know, all trillion should move in one direction or another. That would be you know, one impractical and probably unwise. Um, and so you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's what we call the investment program every year in which we can sort of express most directly our sense of how the macro economy is likely in, to unfold. Um, and the final point I'd, I'd make is you need optionality, right? I mean, you well recall, folks in this room may recall, what, a year and a half ago, great anxiety about a recession. That seems to have calmed down. You know, if we had driven the entire uh, portfolio or the investment program around the, an impending recession, we might have missed some of the remaining upside. And so one also has to maintain a certain amount of nimbleness and flexibility because things unfold in unpredictable, unpredictable ways. Uh, I mentioned that you have degrees in both law and economics. Can you tell us how that training has proved useful in your career? It allowed me to avoid answering some really tough questions. <laughs>
um, and not being afraid of being cold called. Um, <laughs> No, very seriously, uh, both of them have played a really useful role, right? I think you know, the great advantage that lawyers have is the ability to look at facts and fact patterns and figure out subtle but maybe important distinctions or similarities. And you know, if you think about some of the way I've talked about things here, you know, the, the, that's in some ways the way one should think about mar markets and models, et cetera, because it's those subtle distinctions and those subtle similarities that allow you to figure out whether or not something is actually a precedent. Um, and, and that's sort of the training of a lawyer, just to recognizing that, gee, seeing a pattern where it might be a precedent is a really important thing versus the ability to say, oh, no, but this, this might be somewhat different. The economics training obviously just sort of suffuses everything. Um, uh, you know, ability to understand the way markets work, which is not just economics, but it, it's you know broader than that, finance and other things. The ability to to understand the intersection of macroeconomics and markets is is important. So I've been lucky that you know all of the, both of my professional degrees have come into play in this in this uh, uh, career that I've had. Um, and you know, while I wouldn't encourage everybody to stay in school until they're 30, it, it worked out pretty well for me. So, I, I'm sorry, this is a school. I would encourage everyone here to stay, <laughs> pay full tuition, you know, stay here until I know it's eyes the professors, right. Well, the professors are, have already chosen to stay in school uh, right. <laughs> you know, beyond, or beyond 30. Right. So, Roger, what was it like to be the only Fed governor in the office on September 11, 2001? Oh, um, well, you can imagine. Uh, it was highly stressful, which is, you know, obvious. It forced one to prioritize what's really important versus what's not. It called in the question, not in, it made the oath of office that we took to perfect and to defend the Constitution actually you know, quite real. Um, And it gave me a huge appreciation of the phenomenal teamwork that is not just the Fed, but you know, much broader than that. Um, so stressful for obvious reasons, right? I mean, you know, you know, yeah. turned on the TV. My wife called me after the first plane went into the um, World Trade Center. She was a very senior um, uh, staff person and policy maker at the SEC. And, the SEC has a, a market watch desk that is, you know, literally looking at you know, all the TV. And she called me to say something's happened. You know, the, one of the towers is on fire. It's turn on the TV. Who knows what's going on? So, you know, so that's a shock to the system. I then went up to the second floor of the Federal Reserve Building in Washington, which happened to look out in the direction of the Pentagon. And while I was there, you could see smoke coming from the direction of the Pentagon. So we were, you know, under attack, or something weird. I mean, who knows? And you know, people don't re respond very well, or you know, the stress reaction is very high in the midst of so much uncertainty. Having said that, you need to set that emotion aside and figure out, OK, I don't know exactly what's going on. I'll never be able to analyze it at this moment. Let's figure out what's the most important thing to do. And the most important thing to do was uh, to not allow panic to spread through the financial system and not to allow the financial system to be the source of panic. Um, and so that had many different implications in terms of providing liquidity, making statements and other things. But, but it was, uh, you know, you were really became very focused on what are the tools that you have to resolve what is clearly an unknown situation. Yeah. I cannot figure out the cause of planes going into big buildings beyond my bailiwick. Let's focus on what we can do. The third point I made about the, the protect and defend the Constitution didn't seem likely uh, um, that you know, this actually be life and death for you know, the, the Federal Reserve Vice President and the Vice Chairman of the moment. Um, but I decided that I had to stay in the building, even though the President um, ordered an evacuation, because my sense was, you know, 
if I evacuate and you know, protect my life, you know, the whole system would collapse. People were wandering around. You know, there was no place to go. It, it, you know, there comes a moment when you say, I took this oath for a reason. And uh, not to be overly melodramatic, but I'm going to stay at my post. I mean, you, yep. you stay at your post. And I couldn't force anybody else in the system to do that. Um, well, that's not quite true. When I issued a statement that would be open and operating, then everyone had to <laughs> make it open and operate. Um, but it wasn't. Uh, so that uh, that was sort of really important. And then it was all about teamwork. I mean, the, the, you know, what I could do is decide we were going to be open, we we're going to operate, we we're going to flood the system with liquidity, going to make the right set of statements. There are thousands of people in the Federal Reserve System who know what to do. I could not go down and clear checks that night, though I know how to do it. Maybe the only Federal gov Reserve governor who knew how to do that, but I was not going to run the check operating machines and think about all the planes that weren't flying. And I, you know, while I could send people up here to New York to try to deal with the infrastructure that was uh, destroyed over near Wall Street, you know, I couldn't come and do it myself. Um, and so, you know, it becomes a team that says, you know, I know my particular piece of this puzzle, I know what I do to fix it, and they did it. Um, without, I mean, there are a number of decisions I had to make, but there are thousands of others, incredibly important decisions that thousands of people made whose names have never been mentioned. Right. Um, and with huge bravery, and you know, in ways I don't even talk about right now, but important things. And, and, and to be fair, while I talk about the Federal Reserve System, you know, it required everybody, the National Guard and, and New Jersey and Connecticut to help me get money, help us get money into the ATMs that were remaining in, 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 in New York. Uh, just, you know, thousands of Americans who just stood up and were in their own version first responders. So it was all those things. Um, and finally, it was really, a, ironically, a bit about preparation, which um, I had, was the only, I think may have been one of the few governors, I know I was the only governor who had ever gone to see how checks were cleared at night, which is the least glamorous part of the Federal Reserve System. I was fascinated with other elements of the payment system and was the chair of the Payments Policy Committee. I'd been on the Bank Committee. Right. I'd help us think through the crisis that didn't occur that people snickered at, which was the Y2K. But we thought a lot about what would happen if infrastructure was out um, and how we would communicate and things of that sort. And all that stuff came into play you know, at that moment. So you, you talked about you know, my training. So, you know, literally many, many years, um, Davis Polk, McKinsey, all came into play at the Federal Reserve. This, a, a person who I won't name insisted that we tell the president that we, that we should have a bank holiday. And I absolutely refused to do it because we, and I, and I got support from others, so it wasn't Roger being brave. Um, but I knew what it had taken when FDR decided to, to have a bank holiday and what it took to open them up again. And if my job was to avoid creating panic that would affect the markets or avoid creating uncertainty in markets that would create panic in society, you know, advising the president to order a bank holiday, I thought was inimical to that goal. Right. And that was from understanding banks, understanding bank history, you know, conversations I had with my father, all sorts of things who had lived through the Depression. Um, and so, you know, a lot came to play on that day. And, you know, fortunately, history has been kind. And fortunately, we mainly did the right things. And fortunately, it all sort of worked out. And most importantly, um, got to give a huge amount of credit to Alan Greenspan. He didn't, he was flying back and forth from uh, Switzerland trying to get to the U.S. and then had to go back to Switzerland. He finally reached me uh, toward the end of the day. And he did one of the best things ever. Um, and people would not imagine this of him. He called. He said, what have you done? I explained it. He said, you know, Roger, you're in charge. You know, trust you completely. I'm not going to try to micromanage from halfway around the world. You know, a lesser person would have stayed on the phone and tried to order me to do this, doing that. None of that. It was trust you completely. We've worked together for a few years. You're in charge. And even when he got back, 
while he obviously is the chairman, I still ran you know, the needed operations until Monday morning at the FOMC. Um, and you know, it's incredibly important in a moment of crisis for the leader, whomever it is, to give the lieutenant on the ground who knows the, you know, the, the day, the in and out of the uncertainty of the moment, the authority to do what's called for. And nobody in the system ever said to me once, well, what does Chairman Greenspan think? Because Chairman Greenspan did not attempt to second guess anything I've done. Um, you know, the cynical part of me says if it had been wrong, I would have been <laughs> taking the blame. But fortunately, it worked out. And, you know, I have lots of reasons why I have an admiration for, for him. But the ability to be wise enough in a moment of crisis to say, you know, you're in charge and I am uh, six time zones away or seven, you know, it, it took a huge amount of deep insight on his part to recognize that he couldn't micromanage the system. Just as it took leadership on your part to trust all the people who were in the system and who made those things happen. So thanks for your service. Thank you. It really was uh, amazing. Thanks. What, uh, what are the opportunities, Roger, for students who want to pursue careers in asset management? And what advice would you give them? I'd give them, you know, go for it. Um, <laughs> No, look, one, it's, uh, as you can know, tell, it's a rapidly, it's a growing and rapidly changing business. So if I wanted to be in any business as a young person, it would be a business that was anything but stagnant. And this is a business that's changing. Um, we've talked a bit about ESG and responsible investing. We haven't talked much about AI, but that's going to affect the way things go. It's a global business. Um, and it's highly rewarding because you're doing this for mainly for other individuals who are, it's one of the great things about our American capitalist system is the vast majority of the money that's being invested is being invested for other individuals. You know? um, so it's a great business, highly rewarding, very intellectually demanding, and many, many different kinds of roles. So I would absolutely encourage anyone who's interested in finance to take a look at asset management. So I'm going to wrap up with a question related to change. Um, our financial system is undergoing rapid change right now, technological change, and fintech is, you know, everywhere with us. Mm -hmm. um, tell us what you think about the opportunities and risks in blockchain, digital currencies, distributed ledger technology, uh, uh, and fintech in general. All different things. So <laughs> fintech in general, um, again, you know, all different things. I think where I've seen fintech have the biggest impact is at the interface with individuals, right? So I describe this as the Uberization of everything. Individuals expect their smartphones, their apps, uh, to you know, allow them to you know, order a pizza or buy some clothes or, frankly, get a date. Um, I, don't, I don't do that, but others. <laughs> I've been married for 32, 33 years, so that part doesn't interest me. Um, so I think FinTech has been, you know, at, at that interface, it's been, you know, most creative and most interesting. Um, and so we'll see how that evolves. The other thing to observe about FinTech is, you know, big old established financial services companies can do FinTech themselves. So, you know, it is not as though FinTech has completely disrupted what any of the big established firms that some of your students go to work at have, have been able to do. It's been just the opposite, actually. I think that it's been embraced. Blockchain, um, uh, distributed ledger, I think we're learning a lot about it. Um, it's been thought, uh, as I read about it, many people think, well, it's going to be you know, the answer to uh, a lot of the clearing and settlement systems that exist. That may be true, but one of the things that I don't think we understand is how do you correct an error that gets built into a blockchain? The theory of the blockchain is effectively, you know, it's, it's everyone's ledger. And you know, they must be self-correcting somehow. But if you have observed and thought about it, the errors can get replicated in a blockchain world. You know, you can't, in theory, sort of you crowdsource the truth. And that doesn't always work out. And so, you know, what do you do if something gets embedded in the blockchain that proves not to be right? Now, you know, I'm sure there are blockchain aficionados who will now attack me for not knowing the way the system works. But they've got to be able to answer that question. Is it true? And how do you, how do you figure it out? Uh, I think on, on uh, currencies, cryptocurrencies, et cetera, uh, 
very interesting to watch how, how you know, the debate has, has played out, right? And so Libra emerges as at least a concept and idea. Now we're finding some central banks thinking they might, uh, may want to issue their own stable coin. Um, I, I think that the issue with respect to, to, current, to, to currencies or cryptocurrencies is to what degree do they actually have the indicia of being a currency? Um, and a currency, as you well know, is a medium of exchange and it's a store of value and it's a numeraire. Um, medium of exchange means that I give you a dollar, you give me you know, uh, water and we're, we're comfortable. Um, uh, store of value means you store up a bunch of dollars and it makes you wealthy, so to speak, and you can then use them to buy things. And, and numeraire is just sort of an accounting uh, measure, you know, a dollar is equal to a dollar, whatever it may be. Um, and the challenge that I see in crypto is it's really not necessarily good for any of those, uh, the first two of those things. Because, you know, today, given that crypto goes up and down in value, this bottle of water could cost whatever, it's 59 cents. Um, uh, tomorrow, depending on what has happened to the crypto, it could be worth $15,000. Um, uh, and so one has to be careful. And, and so in order for cryptos to actually become currencies, they've got to be very stable. And we'll see how Libra unfolds, but until, or something else, but until the market or central banks develop a stable coin, I think most cryptos are more likely to be speculative than to be actual currencies. Now, I know that's sort of a long technical answer and probably bored everyone in the room. Uh, but you asked, and so that's sort of how I think about it. Um, so we'll see. And so just to summarize what I said, fintech, some real opportunity, particularly at the interface with the consumer. Um, blockchain, correct me if I'm wrong, but the possibility of inaccuracies building up which should worry somebody because there's no one who is taking responsibility for the accuracy. It's supposed to be sort of crowdsourced. And then on the cryptocurrencies, if we can figure out one that's actually stable and the regulators let it go through, that might have a, a role to play. If it's not stable and it moves up and down in value, then it actually doesn't meet the characteristics of being a currency, and therefore I don't think it will have beyond small uses, much broad use. Okay, does that make sense? Absolutely. Well, we've covered a broad array of topics, and you've been very patient uh, in doing that. I was about to stomp out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me that question. And uh, so please join me in thanking Roger for coming. <laughs> <laughs>